Are you all there? Because I will be referring to Hebrews chapter 8 uh, as we go along. Now, I remember a time, now many years ago, just try to think how long ago this was, probably like 30, 34 years ago, where all the students at the, at the Baptist Theological College in Parktown, Johannesburg, would gather every Friday morning for what we called chapel time in those days. I don't know if any one of you ever visited the old college in Parktown. Uh, it was a three-story building and the chapel was right on top uh, in the left-hand corner there. Now, when we went for chapel, we all had to wear our gowns. They were like black silk coats hanging down from us, and obviously as a sign of respect. And someone would deliver a message from the Word. We would even sing, it, sing sometimes. But I remember this one chapel session where uh, Dr. Rex Matthew had invited someone from the SABC's religious department to be our speaker. Uh, it wasn't Keith Duplessis who was the head of the department, but one of his colleagues from uh, the English service of uh, the SABC, the radio service. It must have been a spur of the moment agreement because when we were all there in the chapel already, Dr. Matthew, or the boss as we used to call him, suddenly asked Carol Blondie if she wouldn't be so kind as to accompany us on the old dilapidated college organ while we all sang a hymn. Really, and it was dilapidated. It was falling to pieces. Well, Carol, as you know, can do that very well with a good instrument. But that day, my heart went out to her because the college organ was in a terrible state. It must have been donated by a second-hand dealer who wanted to get rid of it. So Carol did her best, but I tell you, it would have been so much better if she had a decent instrument to play on. Jesus Christ is God's superior high priest. No question about that. But the question is this. Is there anything that can limit or reduce the effectiveness or the superiority, if you like, of his ministry? Nothing? You would agree with that? But how come? Well, because his ministry is based on a better covenant, in a better sanctuary, and with a far better sacrifice than in the Old Testament times. The instrument he ministers through, if you like, is in line with his superiority. But it's the better covenant that's a theme here in Hebrews chapter 8. And the writer presents us with evidence that this new covenant is way better than the old covenant. And he explains that the new covenant is superior because, first of all, it is mediated by a superior high priest. Verses 1 and 2. Read with me. The point of what we are saying, that's the writer to the Hebrews, is this. We do have such a high priest who sat down at the right hand of the throne of the majesty in heaven and who serves in the sanctuary, the true tabernacle set up by the Lord, not by man. Now it may seem like the writer is arguing in circles here, but is he? First he shows us the superiority of Jesus Christ, and then he says, since he is superior, the covenant he mediates must be superior as well. Now, if you look carefully, that is not reasoning in a circle. He's making a logical conclusion here. A superior priest could never minister effectively if his ministry is based 
on an inferior covenant. Or to change the illustration, the most gifted lawyer can do very little if the will he is executing is legally inadequate. The will must be right and legal for the lawyer to be effective. And likewise, it would be unthinkable that our Lord would minister on the basis of an inferior last will and testament. Especially since he established it in the first place. So, no, the covenant he mediates is way superior to the old one. And it must be because he is way superior as a high priest. But now how is Jesus Christ superior? We've looked at this when we went through the book of Hebrews up to chapter 7. But just to refresh our mem memories here. First of all, how is Jesus Christ a superior high priest? Well, he is morally capable, isn't he? Verse 1, we do have such a high priest. And that verse refers back to Hebrews 7 and verse 26. Such a high priest, it says there in Hebrews 7 verse 26, such a high priest meets our need. One who is holy, blameless, pure, set apart from sinners and exalted above the heavens. The fact that Jesus Christ is morally perfect and yet identifies with us or identified with us in our need and temptation makes him superior to any other priest past, present, and I want to say future as well. Those Jews who lived in Palestine at the time, remember those people that this letter was written to, it's called the Hebrews because it was addressed to Jewish Christians living in Palestine. Uh, but there were some of them who wanted to go back to the Old Testament priesthood. If they did that, they would have had to leave the suitable and able high priest. Another thing about Jesus' superior high priesthood is that his work is finished. Look there in verse 1. We do have such a high priest who sat down. Our Lord sat down and is still seated because his work is completed. It's finished. There were no chairs in the tabernacle. Old Testament tabernacle, that is. Because the work of the priests was never done. They offered sacrifices day after day, year after year, decade after decade, century after century, and eon after eon. And every time a sacrifice was made, it was only a reminder that none of the sacrifices ever provided a finished salvation. The blood of animals that none or the blood of the animals did not wash away any sin or cleanse any guilty conscience. It only covered sin until that day when Jesus Christ died to take away the sin of the world. So his work is finished and that makes him far superior. He is also enthroned. Look there in verse 1 again. He sat down at the right hand of the throne of the majesty. Jesus Christ is not just seated. It is where he is seated that adds glory to his person and his work. He is seated on the throne in heaven at the right hand of the Father. And this great truth was introduced earlier in this letter already. You'll remember there in chapter 1 and verse 3. And it will be mentioned again, Hebrews chapter 10 and Hebrews chapter 12. Note this. The high priest of Israel never sat down in the tabernacle. He also never sat down on a throne. Only a priest in the order of Melchizedek could be enthroned because Melchizedek was both priest and king of Salem. Then Jesus is superior because he is supremely exalted as our high priest. Verse 1. 
He is at the right hand of the throne in majesty in heaven. Jesus Christ in his ascension and exaltation is as Hebrews 6, 7 verse 26 says, exalted above the heavens. He is now exalted as high as anyone could ever be. And the fact that he ministers in a heavenly sanctuary is vital to the argument in this chapter. Look, look at how logical uh, <clears throat> it is that our Lord ministers ba based on a superior covenant. Can you conceive of a high priest who is perfect morally administering a covenant that could not change human hearts? No. Could a priest who has finished his work mediate a covenant that couldn't finish anything? Can we conceive of a, of a priest king in the highest heaven being limited and stuck in an Old Testament tent or building that made nothing perfect? Never. The conclusion is reasonable. A superior high priest in heaven demands a superior covenant if he's going to minister effectively to God's people. Amen. You don't look convinced at all. Amen. Amen. Let's hope he finishes soon. Amen. I can already smell the lunch at home. Hope it's not burning. No. Amen. It's the truth. This is the new covenant. It, it, is, it, it is superior because it has a superior high priest. Now, this new covenant is also way better because it is ministered or mediated in a better place. Look there, verses 3 to 5. Every high priest is appointed to offer both gifts and sacrifices. And so it was necessary for this one also to have something to offer. That makes sense. If he were on earth, he would not be a priest, for there are already men who offer the gifts prescribed by the law. They serve at a sanctuary that is a copy or a shadow of what is in heaven. This is why Moses was, was warned when he was about to build the tabernacle that was the tent of meeting in the Old Testament times, See to it that you make everything according to the pattern shown to you on the mountain. Now this is a marvelous truth. That right now Jesus Christ is ministering in his heavenly sanctuary. Now why is that important? Well, the believers in this letter was, was, this letter was addressed to originally knew that there was a real temple in Jerusalem standing, one that they could see, and there were real priests offering real gifts and sacrifices all the time. How easy it would have been for them to go back to the traditional, a tra a traditional mosaic system especially when pressured and persecuted by their fellow countrymen. And after all, how do we know for sure that the Lord Jesus is ministering in a, in a sanctuary? Has anyone actually seen him in his high priestly work? Good questions, but they are good answers for those questions. The logical answer, the first one. Every Old Testament high priest was appointed to offer gifts and sacrifices. So Jesus Christ must, must also offer gifts and sacrifices as well. But these sacrifices were not to be offered just anywhere. They had to be offered in God's appointed place, according to Deuteronomy chapter 12. Now that appointed place is the sanctuary. 
So the conclusion is logical here. If Jesus Christ is a high priest who offers gifts and sacrifices, then he must have a sanctuary where he ministers. Since he is in heaven, that sanctuary must be in heaven. But we should not get the impression here that our Lord's Lord is offering sacrifices in heaven that correspond with the Old Testament sacrifices. Some have done that and have landed in serious error. Never. <clears throat> the word something here in Hebrews 8 verse 3 is in the singular, meaning that something is only one thing. And the phrase to offer in the original tense implies offer once for all. In other words, it's something that was offered once and never again. So on the cross, Jesus offered himself as the one sacrifice for sinners forever. In other words, our Lord is now presently a living sacrifice in heaven. He lives to intercede for us. He lives to plead our case before the Father. But his sacrifice has been offered on Calvary already. He's not offering himself over and over again because that is unnecessary. There's the genealogical answer here. Again, the argument here is sound. If you're stuck <clears throat> and you don't know where you should go here, and there are many people who are stuck in Old Testament traditions and things, and they hold on to them tenaciously. This argument is sound as well. David predicted that Jesus Christ would be a priest. Psalm 110 verse 4. But Jesus' earthly birth from the tribe of Judah would not, not allow him to be an earthly priest. Why not? He could only be a king and not a priest. Why? A priest had to be from the tribe of Levi. He had to be a Levite. So he must be a priest in heaven. He can't be a priest on earth. He would not be accepted in the earthly sanctuary. So he must be serving in the heavenly sanctuary and not in the order of Aaron and Levi, but in the order of Melchizedek the priest king. There's another answer to that question. The typical, typological answer. A type. What is a type? It's an Old Testament picture of a New Testament truth. But something or someone can only be a type when the New Testament uses, uses it that way as a type. So we should not try to make every Old Testament person or event into a type. But what the New Testament uses as types, we can do so as well. Now the word translated here is pattern. In verse 5 is where we get our English word type from. And the idea there is <clears throat> the plan or the model. Moses had to build the earthly tabernacle on the model he had received on the Mount, on Mount Sinai. And he had to be careful to copy it correctly. Now this made me think of, of, of model aeroplanes. When I was younger, I used to love building model aeroplanes. I used to get airfix kits and you used to take the blue and you used to glue the parts together, paint the aeroplanes, and they look quite authentic. And if you looked at them, they represented what they were supposed to represent, a far greater reality, a real aeroplane. But that little model aeroplane was not the real thing. You could not get into that thing and fly it like you could with a real aeroplane. Not a similar thing here. Not exactly the same, but a similar thing. Note, at the time the priests 
who were serving in the temple were serving in a sanctuary that was a copy or an example of the heavenly sanctuary, or as the NIV says there, a copy or a shadow. Moses saw this pattern or type on Mount Sinai and he duplicated its essentials in the earthly tabernacle. And this does not mean that the heavenly tabernacle is made up of skins and textiles. Obviously not. All it means is that the true or the real sanctuary is in heaven. And that the tabernacle and the temple were but imitations or copies or models of the real one. Quite shocking for first century Jewish people. They thought their temple was the real thing. But since Jesus is ministering in the original sanctuary and not the copy, he is ministering in a way better place. So why fellowship with priests who are serving in a copied sanctuary when you can fellowship with Christ himself in the original heavenly sanctuary? Do you see that here? Why are you stuck on earthly types and earthly examples when we have the real thing in place, in the right place? The Lord Jesus Christ. In fact, He is here with us and He is here in us. Hey, it would be like trying to live in a miniature model of a building instead of in the building itself. So far, you may think it's not very practical, but it is because we need to get our thinking straight about these things. And this is in the Bible, and in a book in the Bible that is a prominent book in terms of the ministry of Jesus Christ. Now, the writer has given us evidence for the superiority of the new covenant in two ways so far. It is mediated or ministered by a superior high priest, Jesus Christ. And it is mediated and ministered in a superior place, heaven itself. Now the writer devoted the rest of the section to the third evidence here. Ah, the new covenant, he says, is way better than the old one because it is founded on way better promises. Verses 6 to 13. Let's just read them together. Are you guys still awake? Are you following me? Good. But the ministry Jesus has received is as superior to theirs as the covenant of which he is mediator is superior to the old one. And it is founded on better promises. For if it had been nothing wrong with that first covenant, no, no place would have been sought for another. But God found fault with the people and said, The time is coming, declares the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel, with the house of Judah. It will not be like the covenant I made with their forefathers when I took them by the hand to lead them out of Egypt because they did not remain faithful to my covenant. And I turned away from them, declares the Lord. This is the covenant I will make with the house of Israel after that time, declares the Lord. I will put my laws in their minds and write them on their hearts and I will be their God and they will be my people. No longer will a man teach his neighbor or a man his brother, saying, Know the Lord, because they all will all know me, from the least of them to the greatest. For I will forgive their wickedness and will remember their sins no more. And by calling this covenant new, he made the first one obsolete. And what is obsolete and aging will soon disappear, as he did indeed in 70 AD. It was destroyed completely. Now this better covenant referred to here 
was announced by the prophet Jeremiah in Jeremiah chapter 31. In fact, the words we just read is a direct quote from Jeremiah. And this promise was given to assure God's people of future restoration during the closing years of Israel's history before Judah went into Babylonian captivity. And at the time when the nation's future seemed hopeless and destroyed, God gave the promise of restoration and blessing. And today it applies to all believers from all nations, Jews and Gentiles alike, all God's people, the church of the Lord Jesus Christ. And this better covenant is mediated to us by the Lord Jesus Christ. Remember what the Lord said to his disciples in the upper room. This cup is the new covenant in my blood, which is poured out for you. And the Apostle Paul applied those words directly to the church in 1 Corinthians chapter 11. And the writer to the Hebrews states clearly that Jesus is now the mediator of the new covenant, chapter 9 and chapter 12. Now we are ready for the better promises that belong to this new covenant. First one is the promise of God's grace. Grace, verses 7 to 9. The emphasis in the new covenant is on God's I will. The nation at Mount Sinai said with one voice, everything the Lord has said, we will do. Exodus 24 verse 3. But they did not obey God's words. The nation failed completely, dismally. It's one thing to say, we will, but quite another thing to do it. But unlike the old covenant, the new covenant does not depend on people's faithfulness to God, but on God's faithfulness to his promise to his people. So the writer to the Hebrews affirms God's I will no less than six times on behalf of those who trust in Jesus Christ here in Hebrews chapter 8. You see, the law made nothing perfect. And the problem with the law is that it can't change the human heart. It's not that the law is bad, but it can't change the human heart. And because of our sinfulness, the only thing we get from the law of God is condemnation. But praise God, the new covenant is completely of God's grace. God said, I will do it. So the only way a sinner can become part of this new covenant is by God's grace through faith in Jesus Christ. And Jesus Christ, who did it all for us. Grace and faith will go together just like law and works go together. The law says, the man who does these things will live by them. Galatians 3 verse 12. But grace says, the work is finished. It is done. Jesus did it. Trust him and live. That is the promise of grace. God says, I will do it. I will save them. It's not going to depend on you. It's going to depend on him. Second, the promise of eternal change. Look here. Follow with me. That's in verse 10. The law of Moses could declare God's holy standard, but it could never provide the power needed for obedience. Sinful people need a new heart and a new nature within them. Isn't that so? <coughs> and this is just what the new covenant provides. Now, how does it work? Well, when the sinner trusts in Christ, even before he trusts in Christ, he receives God's nature within him, the Holy Spirit. And this divine nature creates a desire to love and obey God. By nature... Sinful people are hateful and disobedient. 
But this new nature gives each believer both the desire and the ability or the power to live a godly life. And all this happens internally inside us. The problem with the law is that it is external. God's demand were written, demands were written on tablets of stone. But the new covenant makes it possible for God's word to be written on human minds and human hearts. So God's grace works in an internal transformation in us that makes us a trusting believer, trusting more and more uh, in Jesus Christ, making us more like the Lord Jesus Christ. And it's absolutely wonderful. It is liberating when you receive a changed heart. It's so sad to see that many people think that they are saved by grace, true, but then fulfill their Christian life according to the Old Testament law, living to it or living uh, in a legalistic relationship with it. They want the new, new covenant for their salvation, but the old covenant for their lives and for their sanctification. The, the Apostle Paul described it this condition in Galatians 5 verse 4 as falling away from grace. You see, we don't become holy people by trying to obey God's law in our own power. It is by yielding to the Holy Spirit within that we fulfill the righteousness of the law. And this is all of grace. God does it inside us. And we want to do it. That's the whole difference. There's a third superior promise here in the new covenant. The promise of forgiveness. There is no forgiveness under the law. Only judgment. When you break God's law, you are, it judges you as a sinner. And, and the punishment for breaking the law is death. Eternal death. You've done it and it's finished. But it's only through the sacrifice of Jesus Christ that forgiveness is possible for those who call on him. The Old Testament sacrifices brought a remembrance of sins, but never a cleansing from guilt and sin. But now God promised here in verse 12, for I will forgive their wickedness and will remember their sins no more. Now what does it mean when God remembers our sins and wickedness no more? Does it mean that our all-knowing God actually forgets what we have done? I don't think so. If God ever forgot anything, he would cease to be our all-knowing God. The phrase, remember their sins no more, means not holding our sins against us anymore. God knows perfectly well what we have done. He's not blind. He's all-knowing. He knows. He knows what you have done. But he doesn't hold it against us. He deals with us based on his grace and mercy and not on the principle of law and merit. It means that once our sins have been forgiven, it is never brought up again. The matter is settled forever, eternally, in Jesus Christ's atoning sacrifice on the cross. Have you trusted in him? I know many of you have. But maybe you haven't done that yet. You haven't received the full forgiveness directly from God by trusting in Jesus Christ. Having your conscience cleansed and washed. Being made new inside by the Holy Spirit. Trusting the Father and the Son. 
I sometimes heard people say, well, I can forgive, but I can't forget. Well, of course you can't forget. In fact, the more you try putting the scene out of your mind, the more you will remember it. So that isn't what it means to forget in the biblical sense of forgetting. To forget means not to hold it against the person who has wronged us anymore. We may remember what others have done, but we must treat them as though they never did it. How is this possible, you say? When I see that person, I want to commit murder. What did you do? Well, it is possible because of the cross. For there God treated his son as though he had done it. And our experience of God's forgiveness makes it possible for us to forgive others. You see, there's one last one. And then we'll have communion and then we'll be finished. There's the promise of eternal blessing here. Verse 13. The old covenant was still operating when this letter was written. The temple was still standing and the priests were still offering their appointed sacrifices. And devout Jews probably thought that their Christian friends were foolish to abandon such a solid religion for a faith that was seeming invisible for all practical purposes. What the believed or the unbelieving Jews did not realize was that their solid religion had grown old and was about to vanish and be destroyed completely. And it happened in 70 AD when the Romans uh, came and destroyed the temple and the city of Jerusalem completely. And obviously it was a tragic time in the history of the Jewish people. It was destroyed. And it has never ever been, been reinstituted because it's obsolete. Now, in stark contrast to this, the new covenant, the better covenant, brings us eternal blessing. Jesus Christ is the author of our eternal salvation and eternal redemption. And he saves us by the blood of the eternal covenant. And this new covenant will never get out of date, my brother and sister. It will never be destroyed. It will never, be, it will never disappear. Uh, that word new, used there in verse 13, in the original means new in quality. This new covenant is of such amazing superior quality that it will never have to be replaced. It will never grow old. Yes, our Lord is ministering based on a better covenant, a new covenant that makes us partakers of the new nature and the wonderful new life that only Christ can give us. Hey, it's about Christ. The other things are not unimportant. Other things we believe in and trust in and other preferences, cultural applications and so on are important. But if Christ is lost, Christ in all his glory, Christ in his humiliation and his exaltation, Christ the sacrifice for our sins, Christ Christ, Christ, our Lord and Saviour and friend and Master of everything. Let us not forget Him. And it happens easily, isn't it? We discover something and it seems so inviting. It seems so good. It makes such good sense. <laughs> it's about Jesus Christ and His new covenant. If you miss Him, you miss everything. Amen.